I am William Castle, the director of the motion picture you're about to see. Oh, it's good to see you again, my homicidal friends. Uh, this time, uh, we have even a stranger tale to unfold. Oh. Ah, blood. He came at it with an approach of, I'm going to show you this. It's not, this, is, this movie's going to shock your pants off. I'm going to shock your pants off. He was the last of the showmen. That's what he did. That was his job. He wasn't an auteur director. He was a showman. For the first time in motion picture history, members of the audience, including you, will actually play a part in the picture. Well, it's his image. It was this big, brash showman who was basically saying, I don't care what you've seen before or what you're going to see later on, but you've never seen anything like what I'm going to show you. My latest picture, Mr. Sardonicus, offers something no audience has ever had before. The attitude that he had was so playful. It was almost like a kid that puts a dollar out with a string on it and hides behind a thing and waits for you to reach out and get it and then jerks it out. He was having a good time. Uh, no more dictation today. The carnival had the Barkers who would stand on a platform and give you this spiel. I think William Castle had a, a lot of that in him. He'd scare you one moment, but then pat you on the head and say, you know, it's OK. It's only a movie. <laughs> Statisticians tell us that if you were to take a poll of what folks are doing this evening, more people would be watching television than doing most anything else. More and more families were actually sitting home watching TV than going out to the theaters. And they would do things to get people off their duffs. They were coming up with wilder things and making going to the movies more of an event. That's when the big studios came out with Cinemascope. Todd A.O., stereophonic sound, started doing these big epics because you couldn't see that on television. Well, 3D burned out very quickly, but the kind of stuff that Castle would do, it wasn't the same sort of thing. It didn't require special lenses. I wasn't quite sure at what point I knew it was a William Castle film, but you knew that the, there were these gimmick films that were a lot more fun. The first gimmick film he did was uh, Macabre. He ensured each member of the audience with a burial policy in case you died of fright. The life of everyone in this theater will be insured by Lloyd's of London for $1,000 against death by fright. For $1,000, you couldn't buy that kind of publicity. God forbid you died of fright, he'd become a millionaire. Die of fright? Who collected? Nobody collected. There are creepy movies, let's face it, and they're very scary. You don't want to look at the screen. But you recover. Nobody comes out with white hair. was actually pretty routine, but it made just a fortune. And they realized, wait, wait, we got something here. And they said, what are you going to come up with next? And he says, uh-huh, let me think about that for a while. In House on Haunted Hill, the gimmick was called Emergo or Emergo. But I think it was Emergo because it emerged. And it was a, a skeleton. A curtain opens up on this, from this box, and a skeleton comes out on a wire. And then all you can do is look at it. <laughs> It looked like somebody rolling out of laundry. You know, it made noise like a clothesline. It didn't do anything, it just dangled there. Then it goes back again. I saw that in a very, very large theater. Now, if you saw that in your local theater, it would probably have been a lot scarier because it only would have been about six or eight feet above your head. But in this theater, you always needed binoculars to see it, so it just didn't mean anything. You just waved at it as it went by. The skeleton was brought down by a barrage of popcorn boxes and Coke cups and stuff. The kids would use it as a target, and they'd just go after it. Emerge, oh, yeah. Never caught on, did it? He did a film called The Tingler. The premise of the film is that at the moment of fright, there is actually a living thing inside all of us that lives during that moment and feeds off your fear. Well, the Tingler monster looked like a slug with legs. And it looked like a powerful thing, like it was all muscle. And it was a slimy thing. Look at that tingler, Dave. It's an ugly and dangerous thing. You didn't go in there really knowing, unless somebody else had gone and seen it and told you what it was. You didn't quite know what was going to happen. The tingler. I feel obligated to warn you that some of the sensations, some of the physical reaction, which the actors on the screen will feel, will also be experienced for the first time in motion picture history by certain members of this audience. I say certain members because some people are more sensitive to these mysterious electronic impulses than others. These uh, unfortunate, sensitive people will at times feel a 
strange, tingling sensation. It was called Percepto. They had motors, vibrating, buzzing motors that they hooked to the bottoms of people's seats. It looked like a, like a little air conditioning unit. It was like a joy buzzer type of thing. It's actually what was happening was a sudden vibration, which felt like a shock. At any time you are conscious of a tingling sensation, you may obtain immediate relief by screaming. Don't be embarrassed about opening your mouth and letting rip with all you've got, because the person in the seat right next to you will probably be screaming too. The tingler got loose in a theater in the movie. The tingler is in the theater. In the same time, it's supposed to be loose in your theater. supposed to go off the projector because the tingler is in the projection room. Then they synced it up so the screen goes blank. And all of a sudden, the wiggling shadow of the, the tingler goes across your movie screen in the theater where you are. And then all of a sudden, the lights go out completely, and Vincent Price tells the audience, the audience you're sitting in, to scream for your life. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not panic, but scream. Scream for your lives. The tingler is loose in this theater. And then, of course, they'd start buzzing these people in the ass. Freeze! Freeze! Keep screaming! We're sitting there, and we hear screams in the back of us. So we, we turn around, and we look back, and you'd see, like, all these people jumping up out of their seats, going, and they're looking down. The tingler has been paralyzed by your screaming. There is no more danger. We will now resume the showing of the movie. By the time he came around and started actually making his name important, he was fairly along in his life. He did this sort of turnaround from being sort of a quiet, behind-the-scenes guy that no one ever knew existed. He just definitely set out to grab people's attention and make them talk. He sold the picture. He was like just as big as, I think, as the, as the stars. He was one of the stars. When you see 13 ghosts, you'll be given a supernatural viewer like this which will enable you to penetrate for the first time into the spirit world. In this film, he had ghosts on the screen that you can't actually see unless you have your ghost viewer. Thirteen ghosts materializing in ectoplasmic color through the magic of illusion -o. You had to put these glasses on to see them. When you saw the guy put the glasses on in the movie, you were to put your glasses on, and then you would see what he was going to see. <laughs> It wasn't like 3D glasses that you put over your ears and you wore constantly. So you just kept doing this every once in a while. The idea is that if you were too afraid to look at the ghosts, all you had to do was not put your ghost viewers on. And uh, it was another thing daring the audience to, to be afraid and be a coward. He wanted to be and have the reputation of Alfred Hitchcock. I think he idolized Alfred Hitchcock, and there might have been some jealousy there with Hitchcock. How do you do? He did uh, guest shots in all of his films, just like Hitchcock, and his films were Hitchcock-like. A couple of them very derivative of Hitchcock. I guess it was a psycho ripoff. In homicidal, if you did not want to see this horrific scene coming up, you could go to the lobby where they had a coward's corner. You can present this certificate at the coward's corner and get your full admission price refunded. Making people go stand in a coward's corner, I remember hearing about that. I mean, that's pretty humiliating. Oh, and please, don't reveal the ending of homicidal to your friends, or they will kill you. If they don't, I will. He went to theaters to see the reactions, to see what worked and what didn't work. So that shows an interest in the audience. Here, film fans line up for blocks as homicidal starts its unprecedented sweep to nationwide popularity. He wanted to walk down the street and have people stop him and say, hey, aren't you William Castle? He wanted that really bad, I think. What was the most delightful piece of mayhem in the entire picture? Oh, I don't know. I guess the ending sure built up the whole suspense. He would make personal appearances because that went along with trying to make himself an icon. Mr. Castle, I'd like to congratulate you on a film fine piece of production. I think uh, Alfred Hitchcock is going to have to go a long way to try and top something like this. Well, thank you very much. That's very nice of you to say. Will you tell your friends the ending of this picture? Oh, no. Never. 
No, I'll let them suffer through it. Oh, I'd never go home and tell Lenny about this, especially my mother. I want her to come down and see something like this. Okay. She'd enjoy it. Uh, do you think it's fair to tell the ending of a picture like this to your friend? No. Why not? Well, it, yeah, well, for one thing, if they're going to see it, it spoils it. And for another thing, let them pay their 70 cents and see it and find out for themselves. Thank you very much. And also the Joan uh, Crawford one with the axe. That's a sort of a Crawford classic. It was an asylum, and it was hell. 20 years of pure hell. Getting Joan Crawford was quite a coup, because he saw that there were people who no longer have the studio gloss and contracts that they had, but they were ingrained in the public's mind as stars. She actually did add a lot of dignity to her picture, even if she had that awful wig on. They were the gimmick. You're going to see Joan Crawford chopping a guy's head off with an ax. I guess it is laughable. Most stuff is after a while. Probably the MTV stuff is going to be laughable. There's no anti-racism things. There's no anti-anything in his films. His films have no message other than boo. You feel that homicidal was shocking and terrifying, you say. Do you feel that it's all right for your daughter to see this type of motion picture? Yes, I do. How do you base this? Well, I've always taught Pat that movies are movies and they should be fun and not to terrify you. That you shouldn't believe in uh, everything you see in the movies. Yeah.